So welcome back. This is part two of the Digimatic calculator repair. The calculator is now fully repaired and I have built this cable and in a moment I'm going to show you how I did it. However, before I do that I want to explain the reasoning behind the, the, the circuit that's, well, that's hiding in this cable here. And I did try to do that when I recorded the original repair and it kind of didn't make any sense when I looked at it in uh, trying, to, uh, trying to put the video together. So what I'm going to do is talk about briefly with the circuit and the reasoning behind it here and uh, then I'll get right into the repair which happened before I recorded this. I will put a link in the description if you want to skip ahead to the actual repair as opposed to me talking about it here. But uh, this is what I did and the calculator is now working. There's a charge, USB based charging cable. So let me explain the reasoning behind this. So as you'll remember earlier on I used to power the calculator itself I used a diode to drop the incoming voltage by about 0.5 to 0.7 volts. Right, so you put that on one side, put that on the other, you know you've got 5 volts here and then coming into the calculator you'll then get across this, you know, we're aiming for 4.5 but we know that this isn't really 5 volts it's you know like 5.1, 5.2 and so there'll be some variation here but the diode will still provide voltage drop of about half a volt. So we also know that what I want to put in here are three nickel metal hydride batteries and so I'm concerned with two things. First I don't want to have well, let's, let's talk a little bit about what's going with the way it works. The batteries are connected to the calculator all the time. So they don't go out of circuit with the calculator when you charge them. If the cable's plugged in, I mean assuming the switch is on, is on then the uh, calculator will see the voltage coming down this cable except to the extent that the batteries buffer that. right? So the battery will protect it until the battery goes completely dead like the one I took out of this previously. So there's that. So that one, so goal one, right? If we think about this as goals, not gowls, goals. Uh, so one is to avoid V greater than 4.5 volts. Right? And goal two is to limit the charging current on the batteries. The original power supply put out uh, 150 milliamps, right? But that's going to be a lot for AAA nickel metal hydrides. And I was really influenced by a video that Big Clive posted a month, a month and a half ago, building a very simple nickel metal hydride or NICAD battery charger that was designed to function at extremely low currents once the batteries were up to the charging level. And I thought I'll do that. I'll aim for like 10 milliamps, right, or so once the battery's mostly charged. And then, you know, if you leave it plugged in, no harm's going to come. Now, that means that it won't have probably enough current output to power the calculator if the battery's out of the circuit, but that doesn't really matter. I mean, that doesn't bother me if you need to charge it for a while. And of course the charging current will be higher if it's limited by a resistor when the battery's lower and the relative voltages are different. So let me explain what the circuit is. 5 volts, 0 volts. This, this is from the USB power supply. Right, so we'll come in, we'll put in the diode, right, so we'll say that's minus 0.6 volts. Then we'll have the battery. Might as well draw it correctly because there are three cells. Then there's a resistor. And the question then 
is what is that? And then we go there, right? So the goal then is how are we going to set that resistor value, right? And the key thing, right, is, you know, what's the voltage across the battery? And what current do we want across the battery, right? And what resistor? So if we have that information, you know, we have Ohm's law. Right? So let's make a guess that the fully charged batteries, right, will be, you know, we're looking at about 1.4 volts a battery or something like that. Here, we can use the calculator to do it. Let me just see if that's coming through. So 1.4 times 3 equals 4.2. They never get quite up to one. I mean, they will kind of approach 1.5 volts when they're totally charged, but which means that the whole battery might go up to 4.5, but you know, let's use that. So V is equal to 4.2 volts, right? So we know the voltage that we expect to see across the battery. We also know that we can take 0.6 volts. So if we add those together, right, 4.2 plus 0.6 equals, that's 4.8 volts. So 4.8 volts. So this is essentially the, bat, the voltage that's being lost across these two, across the diode and across the battery is 4.8 volts, right? Again, this is a real approximation. This isn't how you should deal with batteries. And this, I mean, you can't deal with diodes like this, but you know, I'm just an amateur. This is how I'm going to do it. I know Ohm's law and I have a calculator, right? So not this one though, when I worked this out at the first point. Um, so then the question is, what's the resistor? So we know what we want the current to be, right? So what do we want the current to be? So if we aim at, aim at 10 milliamps, right, we're going to set I at 10 milliamps, which equals 0 0.01 amps, right? So V is 4.8 volts equals, right, I'm doing this wrong. See, this is why I got in trouble before. So what do we want to drop across the resistor? Well, we've got five volts here. So five volts minus 4.8 volts, that equals 0.2 volts. So we've got to drop two volts across that resistor once the battery's at 4.2 volts. Does that make, hopefully that makes sense. So when the battery is charged, it will be at 4.2 volts. And at that point, we want to, we want to know what, the, we want to control the current and we want the current to be um, reasonable, and I've decided 10 milliamps is acceptable for that purposes. So, so, it, so let's figure this out. So V then, for our purposes, is 0.2 volts. I is equal to 0.1 amps. So 0.2, right? So it's V equals I R. 0.2 volts is equal to um, a current 0.01 times R. You know, divide both sides by 0 0.01. 0 0.2 divided by 0.01 is equal to R. And not that we need a calculator for it, but we've got one. which means it's battery charged actually. That's low battery level. Um, so 0.2 divided by 0.01 equals to where 0.2 divided by 0.01 equals to equals 20 ohms. Right, so 20 ohms then becomes sort of 
the ballpark. And I decided I wanted to aim it a little bit lower, and I thought about 30 ohms, and you can do the math. And I eventually went with 27 ohms. So that's the circuit, right? So 5 through the diode, through the battery, 3 cells, through the resistor, to 0. This is 27 ohms. This is three cells at 4.2 volts, and this has minus 0.6 volts across it. So that's the circuit that I'm going to build, or have built actually. This is it here. It's, uh, unwrap this. And it's hiding in here, and the multiple layers of, uh, of heat shrink. And that's what charges this calculator. So hopefully that makes sense and you can understand this. Again, I'm no expert. This is not a perfect circuit. In fact, I think that the actual um, resistance it sees with the cable and even the cruddy plug in there, which is a bit of a problem, I think it sees uh, um, quite a bit less. So, it, you know, that's just the way it is. Okay, so let's work on building this battery pack. So what we've got, and we can just cut these off. So what we've got is we've got a little nickel metal hydride battery pack. Pretty nicely made. There's inside here is a very fine wire, which I think is intended to act as a fuse. Um, have a beer for this activity on a, on a Saturday. Thanks to my extremely local brewery. It's right around the corner. And yeah, so what do we need here? We need to bridge that to that, and then we have our output. So rather than muck around a whole lot, I'm just going to solder it onto this tab here. Messily and uh, and just wrap the whole thing around with electrical tape because I don't think that there's uh, much point in being too fancy about this. So let's move this down and we'll see. I have no idea whether there's any charge on these batteries. They've been sitting for possibly years. Let's find out. Since, all right, we'll zoom back out so you can see the meter. All right, we've got the meter over here and voltage, but that's AC voltage. That's not what we want. I understand why it comes up with AC voltage first, right? It makes more sense, but so actually there's 1.2 volts on this. On this. Let's check this pack here. Oh, I'm going to have to strip those just a sec. Let's strip those. see what we got on these. So we should see 2.4. Yeah, there we go. So, you know, no question that they, these uh, phones shipped with some quality battery packs. These are quite old. They've been used a long time. But uh, I am quite confident in their ability to continue to work. So let's, we might as well tin all of these. And uh, we'll take it from there. Let's see, has this iron heated up? Seems to. There. I think that's very close to my probes here. I'll zoom in a little bit. Slide this into the center. Hey, nothing complicated here, just tinning the, the leads because don't want them to unravel on me and I have to do this eventually anyway. There we go. 
Okay, so this needs to go to here. That's not great. Okay, you can give it a little bit more solder. Maybe a little bit of flux on this end too would probably help. Okay, so let's. Sorry, that was me trying to blow it off. All right, so there we go. So now, if we touch these ends, we should see the full battery pack voltage. And bring that into, there we go, at an angle. Oh, on top of one of the leads, 3.6. That's battery pack. So I'm just going to, as I said, um, wrap a little tape around that. I think I think I was going to double-sided tape that into the, uh, the calculator. Okay, so that's step one. We have a battery pack. Step two is to create a cable. As I said, I'm not going to try to put the plug in it, I don't think, yet. So where did I put my cable that I'm going to cut up for this. Oh, right next to me, of course. So we're just going to cut the end off of this one like that. We don't use that many printer cables like this anymore. And there are, of course, many hanging about. You can see this is a nicely shielded one. Maybe I should have cut up a junkier one. Look at that, we get. A good shield. I mean, let's collect the garbage and cutoff stuff over here. So the power lines in these are supposed to be color-coded. Where's the end of the foil? It should unroll. Oh, there we go. Because the foil is essentially wrapped in a spiral around the cable. Okay. Let me cut this off. And again, you can see there the, there's a the little thread, a little that keeps you from breaking the wires if you pull on it. And now while I remember, I'm going to put a piece of, uh, I have a pre-cut one, well that'll do. I'm going to put a, uh, a bit of heat shrink around here. So the power should be those two. These should be data. The operative word is should, right? But um, so what we're going to do is we're going to solder these two things right in. But uh, I'm going to put these a little shorter. You know what? I'm going to get a longer piece of heat shrink. So I want to be able to, and maybe even a thicker one, I want to be able to cover the whole, the whole construction afterward. Oh, here we go. Okay, that'll do. That's going to give me enough space to cover the whole construction after it's done. And we're going to make sure we get all these little bits and pieces. All right, so we got that. So we have this, and now what we need to do is um, 
Let's plug this in and double check which end is which. So what I'm first going to do is I'm going to do some, I'm going to uh, find my fine wire stripper. This thing came in a network cable kit I bought once and it's turned out to be super useful. I probably use it more than other strippers, but I still think it's probably too small for this. Yeah. So, hmm. great care. There we go. So the other thing is that there well may there may well be enough resistance in the cable that this is totally unnecessary. I should probably check that. If the cable has 27 ohms, right? Because this was not, this is a not designed to deliver a lot of power. So let's turn these quickly. Let's make sure those aren't touching. Plug this in. And get the meter. Okay, I'm going to try to get this in the shot here. Again, get the meter. DC, I should have probably left it there. DC. Okay, so here we go. So we should see positive 5 volts. How do we do, apart from my inability to keep the... There we go. 5.8. Yeah, I'm not seeing a lot of voltage drop along the, uh, along the cable. Let's unplug that. Let's put this... Oh, sorry. Put it on ohms. Um, can I reach? I can never remember which tracks are which. Well, 0.3 ohms. No, I just lost it, but. Try the other one. Come on. There we go. Point four. So, you know, there's almost an ohm in the cable. All right, so let's cut down this resistor on one end. I'll turn that. Okay. Well, let's see if we can solder it onto here. This you're probably not seeing at all. If I can solder it onto here without getting a helping hand tool. Yeah. It's not good, but we're just testing things out. Okay, so we're going to... I did not plan on not leaving a big lump where these... Well, you know what we could do? We could solder that on a bit longer. Okay, we'll do that. I'll just cut this lead down a bit here. That went pinging off across the room somewhere, along with all the other resistor leads that have done that. Okay, so we'll move some solder into here. 
come out. And then let's see if we can get this to stay at an angle that works. I thought I'd have to get out my helping hand tool. I'm fairly terrible at doing this sort of stuff, so well, so far we're succeeding. Sorry, you probably heard me blowing on it. That's pretty ugly. Okay, we'll call that good enough. Okay. So what we got here is we got our charging cable. So let's see what we see at the end of this cable. I'm plugging it into the battery. I mean the the USB power supply here. Okay, we're being careful not to touch the ends of those together. Although obviously if it tries to draw more than an amp, this thing will not work. And let's put this on voltage, DC, and let's see what we've got. Oh, is that in shot? Yeah, this is not. Okay, so we've got that there, and I'm just on one side of the resistor here, and we should see 4.82 volts. So that's about right. That's about what we expect. Of course, with no load, the resistor is not doing anything. It's not dropping you know, because the, the effect on the current of a resistor varies with the amount of, you know, the voltage drop on a resistor is related to the current with no current essentially being drawn, right? Whereas the diode is relatively, I mean, there is some effect, but less. So now what we're going to do is unplug that and we're going to tack these onto the battery pack. So let me and we're going to see what happens. So let me get this in the center, sort of. I'll we'll sort of bend stuff around so it'll work. Make sure that's unplugged before we muck around with it. Okay, so We'll tim this. Okay. Now we'll do the same thing on this side here. big gob of solder on the iron, but yeah. let's bend this over a little bit so I have a bit cleaner shot to get to it. And then we'll try again. Again, so what we're doing is temporary. It's not being helped by this bit of wire from the... Okay, so what do we got? We've got a USB cable. We have a five volt power supply. We'll put, we have a battery, which we know is at, well, let's, Let's see what the voltage on the battery is. You know what, I'm going to get a second meter in here and then we can have a pretty good idea. I'm going to pull the probes out of this one because we'll use this as a clamp meter right here. 
there. That should work. Okay, so this is going to go into current. DC will zero that. Okay, so now we know the current there. Let me get my other meter here. And we'll take off its. Okay, we're going to zoom out so that there's some chance of everybody seeing everything. We'll put this on the battery pack so we can see the voltage and whatnot at the battery. So this is the voltage of the battery. The current should be the same, right? So 5.8 volts. So we'll be able to see the voltage drop down this cable and the voltage drop through this depending on where we have our probes placed. And here I have some really cheesy alligator clips, but they will work for this. And this old cheesy meter will also work for this. Um, 20 volts, that's fine. Okay, so we'll clip that on here. And the other end on here. So this is now reading the voltage of the battery pack, right? So we've got 3.6 volts. We've got zero amps coming out of the battery pack, which is fine. I mean, this is not drawing enough for this to be able to detect it. So if we plug the cable into here, what do we get? we get 25 milliamps we have the voltage is being maintained at 3.6 across the battery pack that's still 5.08 volts So now I guess we will just wait and see what happens with the charging of the battery pack. That's now reading 0.3 amps, which is consistent with the 0.26. I would not expect this to be very accurate. 0.03 amps. Yeah, 0.03 amps. So I'm going to shut this off now and I'm going to wait and see how the battery pack does. Okay, hi everyone. I've left this charging for a little while and I've done some numbers with my little Ohm's Law attempts to predict what this setup will will provide and I think it's working. We're all within the right ballpark. So we're guys starting to get close to four volts on the battery pack. The current is down to you know ten and a bit milliamps and is going down. Uh, you'll notice this shows uh, 0.02 amps, but the, it shows 0.1 just with the draw from the LED and whatnot, the electronics and the little charger doctor. This is not a very sophisticated thing, but it's always been good enough for my use. Um, the voltage is steadily going up. This is sat here for, you know, one lazy beer, so uh, so I think this works. I would probably not keep it plugged in all the time. I think that would be hard on the batteries, but um, certainly plugging it in overnight to give them a charge should be fine. So I think this is an acceptable solution to the problem of charging the batteries in this calculator. 
Oops, as I bang it into the tripod. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tape these, oh, I'll shut that off and get it out of the way. Tape these guys up as a battery pack. So what I'll do is I will desolder. Now we got more stuff out of the way. So what I'm going to do is desolder these leads and put it in the back here. And these two are going to stay where they are. And I'm going to put the charging electronics. Well, it's not electronics. I mean, is it diode electronics? Oh, that's borderline, right? If it was a tube, it would be electronics. Let's say diodes electronics. It's not active though. Uh, um, Fran posted a brief post about what constitutes electronics. And I think if it's got a diode on it, in it it's just at the edge. But yeah, she's right. It's probably just electrics. Um, but anyway, if the diode is and the resistor will stay in the cable. And what that means is that I don't need to, this will be stock. And theoretically, you could charge it by plugging in the stock charger if you happen to have one. Um, although it would be possibly a little hot for these batteries. But I mean, the same sort of rules would apply, right? Um, as the voltage in these started to get up to the 4.1 volts, very little current's going to flow. And they're probably relying on the resistance, the internal resistance in the batteries. And they were also relying on nickel cadmium being even more robust than nickel metal hydride. So you can really cook nickel metal uh, nickel cadmium sometime and you'll get away with it. Although that said, uh, anyone who kept that calculator plugged in all the time would have gone through a lot of battery packs. So I'm probably going to do a bunch of this stuff off camera because I don't think it's very interesting. And then I'm going to come back and uh, and show you how I built the cable and uh, and how we're going to solder it into here. I do want to double check that this this uh, little plug here is a little rickety. So I want to just check that that's okay. And uh, we'll build up the cable and see if it works. But we will have an intermediate stage when the battery is in here. It's now charged sufficiently. Um, we can take that off. The battery is now charged. So once this is soldered into here, the calculator should work. Um, and, uh, and then we'll worry about getting the charging circuit built into the, into the cable here. I will say my, as I said, my little ohms off prediction is like just about spot on, especially if you run it with about 30 ohms as opposed to the 27 that's in there. And that works if you think maybe half an ohm per battery and then half an ohm for the cable, that takes you to 27, 28, 29 ohms. Yeah, so that's, that's in the ballpark. Again, uh, as you saw from this little charge monitor, the voltage from the power bank does tend to creep up a bit, which gives you a little bit of a higher uh, current, of course, since we're only talking about like 0.2 volts mattering here. So, yeah. I will say this is if you were, one of these batteries was to go short, which I don't really know if that's a likely thing to happen, probably not. Um, and you were to get the whole 162 amp, 163 milliamps, it will cook this battery pack pretty quickly. And as we saw from the, from the NICAD one that came out of it, um, that can often happen. So I would not leave this plugged in, you know, plug it in overnight, charge up the batteries and unplug it. And that's it. And that's how I intend to use it. Uh, I will say here in Canada, you can get nickel cadmiums, no problem. It's not like Europe where they're a little bit specialized these days. And I could just put nickel cadmiums in it and, um, you know, that would be fine too, but that would involve me buying something and uh, I'd prefer to do it with nickel metal hydrides if I could. Of course, they're going to be a little bit less robust to running large amounts of current through them, which is why we have a resistor in this circuit, which we probably wouldn't bother if we were doing with nickel cadmiums. Okay, so let me get these taped up and in here and we'll see if the calculator works. As I was taking this apart, I actually started reading the back of this more carefully. 
and we've got some display indicators information. Some of these are a bit hard to read, but it says L indicates blah, blah, blah. Batteries, presumably, that looks like a B, should be recharged. So the chip gives you a low voltage indicator. That's really interesting. Pretty neat. So this looks a bit of a mess, but there's the battery pack. It's stuck down with some double-sided tape, which will hopefully stay. Um, it's connected in. I, glued, I soldered it over to here for the negative and over to here for the positive. They're well apart, so I don't think I need to get too concerned about sleeving them. Um, well, it should be all right. If it does rattle around, I will figure out a better solution to hold it in place. The problem I have is that this is badly oxidized, the plug here, and so far I haven't had too much luck with getting it to, uh, to connect. But I will show you that if I turn it over, we have power. It's a working calculator. 9 times 9 equals... Oh, that's probably just my meter deciding to shut off and the power switch works. So, we have a working calculator. The question is just cleaning out that switch. And I think I'm just going to, I mean, it's quite badly messed up, but I'm going to uh, put the back on, well, probably leave the back off for a bit, but I'm going to scrape it out with a small screwdriver, see if I can see power on this little cable, which is what I'm going to use. This fits there, it does seem to be clipping in, so that should be good. And uh, and then this will go onto here with a whole lot of heat shrink to protect everything. And so that's the plan, but this plug has created problems, and I can't really un. Um, and again, that's the meter. I'm finally deciding to shut off, but uh, the uh, there's not. I can't really. I'm having trouble taking it out without risking scratching up the outside of the calculator more than I'd like to. So, yeah, um, that wasn't something I anticipated. But I will see what I can do with some contact cleaner and a small screwdriver, and get back to you. But, you know working calculator with battery pack. We have the battery in. It's working. The calculator is put back together now. Although this screw could be tightened more. Yeah. There we go. So we got that all in. Now, if we plug this in here, we see 3.85 is about the voltage of the battery. So really that jack should be replaced. It's been fairly badly damaged, but it'll be all right, at least for now, to try things out. And if I can, I can always spray more uh, contact cleaner in it and and make an attempt to scrape it out. The, the issue is the top contact here um, has just got really kind of chewed up by the battery electrolyte. I was able to clean the pan reasonably well. So, you know, I mean, so you can see it's not it's not ideal. That's probably about what the battery is at the moment. It's not ideal, but it'll work, at least for now, and I can improve it later. The battery is stuck on with double-sided tape, and we know where the positive is in here, and now let's remind ourselves which the positive is here. Let's, uh, Let's put a little bit of tape on that one, just so we know that that's, that's the positive. 
There we go. We'll try to keep those apart because these are, well, we'll take them out of the calculator. That solves the problem. Okay, so now we want to have a look at this. So let's hook this back together. Okay, since we got this meter out, put this meter here. Let's just remind ourselves what the positive is here. Right, positive is the diode side, which is what I remembered. So off that goes. We got the meter out of the way again. And so now we just need to figure out exactly how we're going to do this. Um, and what I think I'm going to do is get some smaller heat shrink here. There's a blob of solder. Oh, here we go. Oh, that's too small. There's some green stuff. Oh, there's some blue stuff. There's some more blue stuff. Those will work. We just want to be able to cover... Oh, that's a bit too small. Is this one okay? Yeah, those are both a bit too small. We want to be able to cover... our components here before we cover the whole thing up with a big piece of heat shrink there. So let me find another one that's a bit thicker. Yeah. Apologies for this. Okay, so here's a green one. Those are both, both work. And then we'll get a tool for shrinking heat shrink. I really like this uh, little um, butane powered soldering iron. It works really well for lots of things, but it's excellent for heat shrink uh, if, you take, if you take the tip off. Okay, so what we're going to do is we'll start with this one. What we'll do is we'll take the heat shrink and back it down here so it doesn't shrink on us prematurely. Oops. There we go. Then what we'll do is we'll clip this off quite short because there's no point in making this longer than it needs to be. The soldering iron Retin this one. And then if I can line these up without melting anything that I shouldn't be. shrink will go down once it's cooled off enough that it won't. The heat shrink will then go down over here. Right? For this one we'll do the same thing. Where are we about lengthwise? Yeah, so we can do this right at the diode here. <laughs> that went ping somewhere. Let's make sure that this is Thick enough. No, we wanted this blue, this green stuff. Right. So let's get that out of the way. Get our diode up in the in the air. I'm sorry, I'm not zooming in more for this, but I'm just I'm moving around enough that I'm just kind of lose it. Uh, from the center of the screen if I try. Sorry, I'm not going to make this very easy to see, I don't think. Oh, 
All right. Yeah, that's not great. All right, that looks a little better. So we've got our diode and our resistor, and they're now going to be under this heat shrink in this weekend. This I stole off an AM antenna, which I used for an earlier experiment, which you might have seen on here. Okay, and then we'll put this thick piece on afterward. So let's just get, I've got too many things around here. And there we go. There's no flame, it's kind of hot air. It takes a moment to heat up, but not too long to do heat shrink. So there we go. There's our first layer of heat shrink, and now we'll bring this over like that and try to do the whole lot. I've only used this little thing for soldering once or twice. I don't, it works for that, but it's uh, because it's so, um, the heat comes out the side of it, right? It's essentially a hot air gun that blows on a tip, like I think all these things are. Okay. There we go. So we have our charging cable. So the charging cable has a diode. And oh, I left it plugged into the power bank the whole time. Well, that's not good, but fortunately, I don't think I shorted anything. Well, let's see what we got. So we'll bring the. Well, I've got it backwards. Right, remember, I said it was center uh, negative. And there we go. It works. So the question is, is it actually going to charge the calculator? Well, let's find out. What we need for that, as I reach across to the other part of the room and get the clamp meter. Probably shouldn't have twisted this all back together. Okay. So we're going to put this on here. We'll just turn the calculator on just to make sure it works, right? Works. We'll plug this in here. I mean, the, the big issue is this plug, right? So now this is, you can see this is on. Well, we could get some idea of whether it's charging. So if this reads much more than 0.1 amp, it's definitely charging. Mm, point 0.1, point 0.2 when you wiggle it around, right? So let's try the clamp meter. Right, for two, I'll turn that back on. Okay, let's set that for DC. Um, let's unplug this. I'll put that through there. All right, we'll zero it. Zeroing this thing is always a bit important. We'll plug it in. It's charging the battery. If we turn this on, you can't see it from that angle because of the way the display works on this thing. But does the, I bet the amperage won't go up because I think it's being limited by the resistance in the system. I don't think, yeah, turning on the calculator doesn't turn on. It's drawing from the battery. So, I think it works. I think we have an entirely working charging solution. Unplug it. And it drops down. So we have a calculator that is restored and a special purpose USB calculate, uh, charging cable for charging it up. This calculator is 
totally workable. It was replaced very easily with, well, relatively easy, fixed relatively easily with that bodge wire. This plug is still a bit touchy, but it's at least going to allow us to charge the battery, I think, and if it becomes too much of an issue, that can be replaced or can be scraped out a little bit more. Um, this cable seems to be a completely workable solution. As you can see hidden inside, you can see the resistor I'm poking through here. Right? You can see the resistor right there, and there's the diode right there. And they're both inside this cable, which I think came out rather neatly. So, I'll just give you one more idea of just how nice the display on this is. It's really quite pretty. Eight digits. Um, put in oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. Uh, memory plus. So we've got the little dot for the memory. Um, clear memory recall. That works. Percent. You see, so we saw that. What that works. Um, divide by three equals. We saw K works. I don't know if that's really exponent. I don't know what that does, so I'll have to figure that out. I'm sorry, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to do what it would do on a scientific calculator. And I don't know how much of this you can see. I can only see my phone up here at a very weird angle. Nine times nine again. And we can memory recall, memory clear, clear. We saw percentage works. I still don't know what D does. Anyway, I'll have to look at the manual. This is a very nice calculator. Um, I'll zoom back down a bit. It's funny, it's got the fake sort of leather plastic, which was very characteristic of the 70s. But um, I'm very pleased with this repair. Thanks if you stuck with me for this long. The Digimatic M82 is fully working, has batteries, doesn't seem to be shaking around. Um, there's not, not much to add. It's a fully functional, repaired calculator, and I intend to use it. I'll keep it right here on my desk. Um, an HP would make me happier. A uh, TI might as well, but I mean, this is... You know, my father might have had a uh, an HP that was older than this or about the same age of this. The oldest one I had is from about 78 when I was a kid, and that's long gone, unfortunately. I think it was the same one that Fran uses on her channel, if I remember correctly. It wasn't a very uncommon calculator and was a relatively inexpensive scientific from that era. So I'm going to put this on to charge. and. Once again, thanks for sticking around with me. If you like these kinds of videos, please subscribe. Um, you can get notifications as well. I post about weekly with serious content, but I also do, you know, radio stuff and uh, anything else I might be interested in sometimes gets posted a little bit more often than that. Thanks again.